What about BLM? I'm sure you can go off forever on Black Lives Matter. Do I have to be nice? What kind of program is this before I say what I got to say? I think they full of They are another group of people that have bamboozled. They have taken our history is what they've done. Because let me tell you something about black folk. We don't believe in transgender. We don't believe in bisexual. We don't believe in abortions. We believe in none of that stuff. And they, it's a group of people that has taken our history and made it their agenda is what they've done. And that's what they do to motivate or to manipulate society. When you control the most powerful people, you control the masses. I want to be on record saying that Black Lives Matter is one of the most scam, fraud organizations I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, you look at what's happened recently in the news, their, their founder just recently stepped down because she, everyone found out that she was on a buying spree of houses with the money that they've been raising. And then you look at where these houses are, she, one of the houses in her neighborhood with, I think 0.02% of the people are black in that area but she's out there with her megaphone and she's telling you to take to the streets while she's behind a gated community um and she's living the dream right copy that uh here we go all right this is getting serious oh 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 my goodness my take on blm is they're a marxist terrorist organization something i find interesting about blm is none of the money that they've been given was allocated to any of the black inner city communities nor was it given to my community that i grew up in they're using black lives matter the pain of a black man being you know killed by the cops you know whether, whether they, they was wrong or not of course the mother is going to going to cry or the family is going to cry over that loved one whether they was wrong or not but what they're doing is they're taking that and trying to use the black community to rise against the police department to bring anarchy in this country. There are some good cops and there are some bad cops. But when one cop make a mistake, you want the whole nation and all to suffer. My grandfather got shot in the back on furlough, taking my mother to get a coat. That was in the 30s. Some black guy burned him out and say he had took a chicken from this guy farm. The policeman killed him. Do I need to hate them for what they did uh, 70, 80 years ago? No, sir, and no ma'am. My life is not based upon that. And then 55 years later, the man wrote my mother and tell her the story that troubled him every day of his life that he the one did it. I cannot say that you're responsible for what happened back then. I cannot put this on an officer back then or his generation back then. Only God can handle these things. We're using the issue of race to help people buy into Marxist ideology. So race is just a smokescreen to control people because that's the end of Marxism. So Marxist ideology is putting on a mask of race in order to bring people under control. Black Lives Matter stands for burning, looting, and murdering. Well, they raised $90 million last year. Where did that money go? Because they had more, they had almost half of their chapters across the country, their own chapters signed on to a letter, one of the most high profile one, Hawk Newsom, who leads Black Lives Matter in New York, signed on to a letter saying that they have not seen any of those funds. They were loaded on buses and taken to cities to stir the pot of hatred between blacks and whites. There's only one reason people do that. It's because that division brings power to those who are establishment and in leadership. That whole organization, just like everything the Democrats have ever done, is built on lies and exploited pain in the black community. They took a tragedy like George Floyd's murder and they blew it up to raise money. Every dollar that was given to BLM went to Democrat candidates. That is mine! George Floyd! That is mine! George Floyd! That is mine! George Floyd! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! 
They're burning down black businesses. When is Black Lives Matter stood up for um, David Dorn who was killed in the street? The man who was killed in the street, a police officer, a retired police officer who was killed in the street senselessly. No one says, said his name. No one said the name of Sequoia Turner. No one said the name of Legend Talia Farrow. The little kids who were killed in the midst of all this violence in the inner cities. Little children. Stand for the lives of the unborn. Stand for the lives of these children who are killed senselessly in the inner city. I have yet to see them go to the inner cities of Chicago, South South Chicago, Detroit, Dallas, Atlanta, any of these, Memphis, and talk about the black on black crime. And what about the conservatives that are black, like myself? Is it only the black lives that they choose matter? Is it select black lives matter? When have they made a sandwich and taken it to the homeless community? When have they picked up the trash that is down in the in the uh, in the inner cities? When have they went and mentored some of the the youth and young adult black girls and boys? When have they done that? When have we seen pictures of that? When have we seen the pictures of them going in and and checking on the elderly black community? Black lives do matter. They they do. But saying that Black Lives Matter means that you're going to take the initiative to show something that is different. They had on the website their goal was to help destroy the two-parent home. Okay, they didn't, they didn't believe in the mom and dad structure. They removed that part because we called them out nonstop on it. Now it's gone. But don't be mistaken. They still believe in that. They're here to destroy the family. You can paint a Black Lives Matter mural on the streets of Baltimore, the streets of Orlando, the streets of, of Utah. You can do all of those things. But does that actually help to change the black communities? No. You have what in the black community, I think the recent count was a 74% single motherhood rate. How can that be? How, how are we convincing black mothers that they should be outside of the family unit, the core family unit being a, a father, uh, uh, a mother and children, or husband, wife? Why are we uh, providing incentives for black mothers to be away from their, um, from their husbands or to keep their children away from black fathers? Um, uh, I think when you look at uh, uh, the real epidemic in the black community, the literacy rate, 83% uh, of, under Democratic policies, 83% of blacks are found non-proficient at, at, at a high school level. These are, these are Democratic policies. And so what the progressive socialist left has done is just pounded white people. You're bad. You're bad. You look at schools and they're teaching our young people. You're bad. You're bad. Go over to the black people and say, I'm sorry. I work for Black Lives Matter. I'm sorry that I scared you. Okay people have had to make it like they're apologizing for their whiteness and could you just please apologize for you know for your white privilege what was more disheartening to me is that um, those who are within the black community are allowing for that to take place because that would be the same thing for us apologizing for our blackness when we're telling our children uh, you're black so you have to do this or you're black so uh, you know white people are going to do this to you God also revealed to me that when you speak those things over your children, you're cursing them. You are speaking curses over your children because I, Christ, did not bring you into the world to see yourself as less than. I, I told you that you were more than a conqueror. I told you that you could do all things through Christ. You're, you're reneging against what I have told you. Whereas the Reverend Al Sharpton led a protest in the Crown Heights neighborhood and marched next to a protester with a sign that read, the white man is the devil. Did you march next to a sign that said? I have no recollection of that. I've marched in uh, many things where there were signs that I did or did not agree with. You have a shooting in the black community and if somebody dies, Al Sharpton will be there. You know, he will be there. He will be the first one on that microphone. But he's made his money off of the backs of black people, right? Over the backs of black, you know, death and everything else. I mean, you turn on black radio, it's hard to even to, to, to listen to black radio because then the, 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 the host comes on and he has to, he or she has to insert their political beliefs. You know, they have to insert, oh yeah, you know, that Trump, he was a racist person and you need to vote for Biden and you need to support Biden, ignoring all the things that President Biden said, you know, that was racist in itself. It's just, you, you can't go anywhere in black America anymore because now the entire culture is built in the image of Al Sharpton. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's a big discrimination against black within the black race itself. Hey, nobody wants to talk about that. I'm so sorry that there's a narrative out there that people feel like only white people can be racist. There's people I've heard in, in the black community have said some of the most racist vow things that if a white person did that to them, they would be up in arms and they would be everywhere about it. If we're telling black, if we're telling white people they don't belong in this area or they don't understand us because this is a black thing or this and that. What if a white person says to a black person, you wouldn't get this. This is a white thing. <laughs> imagine, imagine the uproar in the black community. Imagine how upset, you know, we're walking around black power. OK, well, a white person comes over and says white power. Imagine the uproar. Terrorism from white supremacy is the most lethal threat the homeland. <laughs> I walk outside every day in fear of white supremacy right here in the middle of the hood. Okay, yeah, right. I never seen a white supremacy in my life. Never, and they can't point to one. Where the hell are they? I wish somebody would introduce me to a white supremacist. I would like to talk to them and take pictures with them because I never seen one in my life. It never ceases to amaze me how expert the Democrat community is at race baiting by throwing out inflammatory terms such as white supremacy, and that is our greatest problem, without really planning to have a genuine solution. We get the emotions of the people stirred up, but we do not allow for solutions to the problem. I don't think that it's true that white supremacy is our greatest problem in the U.S. Uh, one, because of, uh, take it myself, I've been able to achieve so much in this country, me and my family, uh, as well as that, um, America is, compared to what my, the country my parents left, America is the one with the most opportunity. And if Joe Biden, you know, wants to go with that narrative, well, look at him. He is a white man <laughs> in America, a straight, straight white male, and he's running the nation where white supremacy is, according to him, rampant. So what does that say about him? He doesn't really care about racism or white supremacy or any of these things. He, he will use these you know, moments to um, symbolically care about black folks, um, like the kneeling on the floor and all those types of things that the, that the liberals do. It is a symbol, but it's not actual policy that will help black people. I am more likely to get shot by someone who is my skin color than a white person walking outside. That's just a fact in black America. You know, when you ignore the facts, to push an emotional agenda, emotional narrative. That's a president who seeks to divide us. I'm looking at athletes like LeBron James. I'm looking at people like Beyonce and Jay-Z. I'm looking at all these celebrities who have gotten rich in this country selling this narrative that we are a racist nation all the way to, all the, way to the bank. You have Oprah sitting there and, and, and let's not forget, you know, I was young, but I still know enough about Oprah to know that I'm pretty sure a lot of white women also create, cater to her success as well, now spitting the line that this is a racist nation. I'm like, who built you, Oprah? We have a black vice president. Not quite sure what she's doing, but she, she's elected, right? The United States has recognized the voyage of the European explorers who first landed on the shores of the Americas. But that is not the whole story. That has never been the whole story. Those explorers ushered in a wave of devastation for tribal nations, perpetrating violence, stealing land, and spreading disease. The Democrats are great at projection, and Joe Biden is one of the biggest racists that, that's been in our Congress for 50 years, and now he sits in the White House. And, you know, he called um, our cities concrete jungles. He didn't want his his um, grandchildren, his children going to school in a racist jungle. That's the racism. Joe Biden is the racist. There is no one who has lived through the 50s, 60s, and 70s and have been able to make it to where we are right now and can say with a straight face that America is a racist nation that is patronizing. And it also spits in the face of Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King. It also spits in the face of Malcolm X. Because if BLM, Black Lives Matter, 
Antifa. Hands up, don't shoot. Don't shoot! Hands up! Don't shoot! If they're right, then Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Medgar Evers, and even Malcolm X, they're wrong. My grandparents had a cross burned on their property. We were slaves in the past. We're free now. What we're seeing, and Joe Biden is perpetuating this, even though it's not Joe, Joe's just reading a script, in my opinion. What we're seeing is a theft of valor from those who actually were civil rights warriors. This is a man who eulogizes a white supremacist. Then it's easy for you to see through the facade that is Joe Biden. I, uh, for a lot of us, he was a friend, and he was a mentor, and he was a guide. When, when you're talking about um, white supremacists, right, and the words that Biden have to say, I guess he would know a lot about it because he did, after all, write the 1994 crime bill that helped to incarcerate a lot of black People. It doesn't matter whether or not they're the victims of society. The end result is they're about to knock my mother on the head with a lead pipe, shoot my sister, beat up my wife, take on my sons. So I don't want to ask what made them do this. They must be taken off the street. Why is it now that I should be believing anything that Joe Biden has to say about, you know, uh, the fact that he's like black people best friends right about now. He's our savior. No, I'm not buying that. You're the same Joe from 1994 that wrote that crime bill. I can imagine what MLK and some people are doing right now. They fought to be able to get us to a point where we're at today. Where we can go apply for the same job that anybody else can apply for. We could sit here in our... In our, in our suit and tie and we can have interviews we can be on tv we have black anchors black basketball players black celebrities but yet we're still saying we're victims no we are not if we if we are a victim it's because we choose to be we are choosing that life no one not democrats not republicans no one will change our life no one policy will change our life we have to change our lives so Democrats definitely push victimhood uh, to make sure that the black community especially is more dependent on the government. Uh, running in Congressional District 7 in Baltimore City, uh, the first thing people would say to me is, number one, I've never met a Republican before, so thank you for coming to our neighborhood and provide an option. But number two, we hear that Republicans are going to take away our disability. We hear Republicans are going to try to take away our welfare, our food stamps, everything. And I'm like, where does this even come from? And these are the things that Democrats tell individuals. And so when you have four generations that have been on government assistant programs, of course, they're going to be afraid to leave that government assistance because they don't know what the unknown is. And in terms of uh, victimhood, uh, let's be honest, life is not fair. Uh, but one thing you have to always count your blessings and your advantages. And one thing is we've all won the lottery by being born or living in the United States of America. So we're already privileged in that aspect, but we always take that for granted. I'm gonna tell you how we were raised. I was born in 63, I'm the last of the baby boomers. We were taught as black Americans, we have always had to work harder than anybody else. So it's in our DNA. We know we have to work hard. And what's holding us down right now is the media, between the Democratic Party and the media. Those are the two threats not to just Black America, but to the entire world and to the democracy of this Republic of the United States of America. I'm running for mayor of Miami, not because I need a job and I haven't run for all these positions. I ran for uh, commissioner of Coral Gables and I, I never, and I wanted to, bring the race card because I didn't want to be the victim that the Democrats are telling everyone, everyone that if you don't make it, it's because there was a white person who kept you down and now you are just a victim. If that's the case, so that means that my husband is that oppressor and I am the victim. We're not victims. 
you know, life is not always happening to you. Sometimes life is happening for you. And a lot of times what liberals do is they try to force this, this victim mindset onto people, especially onto black people, I could say. It's kind of part of dividing us into our little boxes, but part of keeping you into that box is keeping you in a mindset of victimhood. And where it comes from is whenever, again, that racist card that is pulled, this is racist, this is where black people, there's an injustice and we can't get a job, we don't get equal pay, we don't get that. And then we talk about all the, you know, the racism that's out there in America, but, you know, they called uh, Obama, the, the first black president, overwhelming number of people that voted for him. Where was the racism then? We have got to get out of this concept that victim that victimology, that victim mentality, it's going to destroy our country, it's going to destroy our communities. I personally think the Democratic Party is running out of ideas. Quite literally, it used to be, oh, it's the blacks. Now it's the Asians. Now, now it's the whites, hate the whites. At some point, they're gonna run out of things, which is probably why they're creating genders. Right now, our community is being taught to blame everyone else for our problems. No way that we're the issue. Forget the fact that we're gunning each other down in the streets. Forget the fact that we're killing our unborn. Forget the fact that we are not telling our black young men and women that they can be anything they want to be. Blame America. Blame the white man. Blame everybody else. When I was coming up as a young child, my mother and them would wait in line for hours for food. When my mom, uh, had at, at least five kids at that time. My mom and my father would work from sun up to sundown. My mother would go and iron clothes for people. And those winter days comes in and it'd be so cold and you got children to feed. We didn't have any gas at that time. We had things that we growed on the farm. So see, Back then, we didn't blame a white person for what we went through with. Everybody hate. Where did the hate come from? It's come from the individual. I can't hold you responsible for 400 years of slavery. I can't do that. One thing I have discovered in my years of living, and I've lived for seven decades, is that the Democrat Party manipulates the African-American community. They're very, very good at that. The Democrats uh, have always lied uh, to keep black people in their party since black people became a part of their party. The Republican Party was actually the first home of the black vote uh, because Lincoln freed the slaves and the slaves voted uh, Republican. Now. The distortion came right after the death of JFK. Lyndon Johnson becomes president of the United States and uh, it was necessary to keep that type of momentum that just love JFK, just love John Kennedy, going for LBJ who was not known to be a friend of black people coming out of Texas. But I've got to prove that it discriminates, and I can't prove it in Texas. There are more niggers voting there than there are white folks. Johnson's bright idea was, hey, let's then uh, raise up, or at least allow that black mother who's having those children out of wedlock, or that poor white mother who's having those children out of wedlock, or that family that might be struggling. Let's offer them government assistance. What the hell I need reparations for? I was never a slave. My mom and daddy were never slaves. My grandparents were never slaves. But I will tell you this, if we continue to live in a slave mentality in the black community, then we will never advance ourselves. Uh, you've heard it said often, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You've often heard that. That epitomizes the Democrat Party. They told the poor whites, they told poor blacks that, hey, we're from the government and we're here to help you out of your despair. They launched what was called a war on poverty. And the war on poverty actually turned into a war on the family because what happened was the government became daddy and the government then, because they were daddy, they didn't want another daddy in the house. 
The lie was, is that it's okay. You, we'll take care of them. And uh, if you have some more, we'll give you more money. This is something that has been a deception given to America over the course of time, over the period of time, that is now we're seeing the fruits of it. We have planted those seeds 50 years ago, and the children of those seeds are now giving grandchildren to those seeds, and this is the amazing thing about it. They're believing the same lie. They're believing that more money solves social ills. The only community that has received what I call weird reparations is the African-American community. In other words, we'll give you free abortions. We will give you uh, opportunities for welfare as long as you push the man out of the house and we'll give the lady a check. They destroy and minimize our community. So there have been efforts throughout the history of America to make restitutions to various parts of the American family. But the African-American community has generally received programs that suppress and minimize our growth, our population growth. So that's something very unfair that needs to be dealt with, in my opinion. And now here we go again, the Democrats pandering and wanting to be able to bring, you know, somehow some magical number of dollars to those that were, you know, in, enslaved and to, you know, our family. Wh wh where's that money going to come from? Again, it's another tactic. And if you notice with the stimulus checks, all this was was getting people hyped. Most of the people, especially the black community, got the stimulus check. Where did you see them at? I've seen them on vacations and and getting three thousand uh, 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 dollar uh, tires and all kinds of things that didn't go back to help really stimulate the economy because all it was was for them to have a toy. Uh, some people went out there and got cars because you was able to put down a, a big lump sum of, of money and get a car and now you can't make your car payment because you want everybody to see you in some car. It happens tax season. It happens with the stimulus check and we'll see it, we'll see it with that. We're going to take tax dollars to get reparations and what is that going to turn? We're not going to see it actually do anything in our communities. The liberal government that we're seeing, they love money and the love of money is the root of all evil. The reason that I left the Democrat Party was because I did not agree with abortion. It's very obvious that abortion has devastated the black community. When you look at the black population being 12.8% of the American population, black women being, let's say, 7.5% uh, of the American population, but yet they make up 43% of abortions in this country, you have to ask yourself, how is that number upside down like that? There has to be a design. Our population is dwindling and diminishing, it's very sad. Um, you know, you never know what we could accomplish if we could get our numbers up and focus on nuclear families and really building our lives. The Democrat Party kind of refuses to allow black people to do that. And that's why black people have to take the initiative and leave and, and turn their back on those policies and that way of life. It's a horrible lifestyle and I can attest to that myself. I've never been a Democrat, but I was surrounded by Democrats at certain points in my life, surrounded by liberals, leftists, and it, it brings you down. It really can destroy you. And I'm just so thankful to God that I just am able to get away from all that and just surround myself and raise my son. I have a nine-year-old, raise him to be a conservative. The Democrat Party today is pushing abortion, they're hurting our children, and so I believe that Democrats have lied to the African American community. The Democratic Party, by and large, has uh, converged on an assault against the black race. When you talk about abortion, and I don't like to use that word because that's buying into the language of the left, we're talking about murdering unborn babies. Then if there is one community has been devastated by the murdering of unborn babies. You are now seeing upwards close to 25 million black babies have been murdered in the womb. So yes, the Democrats have used abortion. The Democrats have used race. And the diabolical duo of those two have seemed to, con seemed to converge upon the black community. You being black 
and you're being murdered. Not by the white man. You're black and you're being murdered in numbers that are unproportional to any other abortion numbers in this country by your black mother. Now friends, I'm not wanting to sound uncompassionate when I say that. The most compassionate thing that I can possibly do is point out that we're murdering our future. One woman said to me in an interview I did with her, she was an elderly woman. She was about 75, I'm not talking about 20 years ago. When she looked at the, um, uh, the abortion rate among black young women, she being an elderly black mother, she could not believe that a time had come where a black woman would kill her child, not after coming through slavery, not after our race has survived slavery. She couldn't believe that. So I'm not wanting to be, show, not show compassion for those who do have abortions, but black people, that was not anything we did. But when it did happen, when, the, when, when Sally, your cousin, got pregnant, or somebody in the family, a girl got in trouble in the family, we didn't kill the baby. You know what we did? All of a sudden, we'd send her to Detroit to visit with Aunt Ethel or somebody. And then Sally would come back home after nearly a year. And guess what? Aunt Ethel had a new baby. It was just amazing. But we didn't kill the child. As a matter of fact, in New York City, and not too long ago, there are more black babies being murdered in the womb than were even being born. They are fighting to destroy black America through abortion. There were two Planned Parenthood establishments within walking distance of my high school. I went to Planned Parenthood with an unplanned pregnancy. The nurse asked, did I want to hear about my options? My options were to have an abortion on Tuesday or Thursday. We can't consistently continue to exterminate black people. It's like putting up a roach box, trying to collect the roaches, as if somehow blacks are roaches. Uh, these roach boxes are these abortion clinics. And where are they placed? They're placed in the corners of the black communities. Why are they placed in white communities? Why are they placed in Asian communities, Hispanic communities? Why are, by and large, the majority of them placed in black communities? They have not stopped their plan to exterminate blacks by flooding our neighborhoods with Planned Parenthood clinics, some the size of shopping malls. Planned Parenthood, America's largest abortion provider, has admitted that their founder, Margaret Sanger, was a racist during her lifetime. Margaret Sanger was a racist and a eugenicist. She admittedly wanted to target the African-American community for population control and reduction. And where do we get this organization called Planned Parenthood from, which the left does not like to talk about? Planned Parenthood was founded by a person that was a white supremacist, a racist, who spoke at Klan rallies. She started the 1939 Negro Project, where she, um, she called black people human weeds that needed to be weeded up out of society and this is what the Democrat Party promote. Hillary Clinton even lifted up Margaret Singer as her hero. And um, this, this gen is a genocide. It was a great privilege when I was told that I would receive this award. Uh, I admire Margaret Singer enormously. Margaret Singer once said that um, she wanted to use the minister to come in and, and use them against it, the rebellious type that would you know try to fight against her because she said she didn't want word to get out that she wanted to exterminate the Negro population. And this is what the Democrat Party has been doing through Planned Parenthood. You know, I believe that abortion is an evil of our time, but I never blame women who've had to make that choice or who have made that choice. Uh, every woman is a child of God. And even if you made that decision, there is forgiveness for all of us, for all of our sins. We have to remember that God is there for us. And so I want to encourage women to, to return to the Lord. In the black church, the topic of abortion will very seldom be discussed. It is uncomfortable. But when I was uh, in the pulpit, and I've pastored three churches across the country from California to Florida, 
uh, and uh, I have served on many church boards. And I have seen, I've noticed that strangely, oddly, even in meetings that are not open to the public, this is not a topic that we talk about. Abortion is not a topic that we talk about. Why? As a pastor, I have sat with women who have experienced the trauma of aborting their child. I've sat with parents and um, women and their husbands or their boyfriends who have aborted their child. My grandfather, Martin Luther King Sr., was very aware of abortion. He convinced my mother in 1951 not to have the DNC and abort me. I was going to abort one of my children legally in the 1970s. I mentioned it to my grandfather. He said, you can't do that. They're lying. That's not a lump of flesh. That's my great-grandchild. You can't do it. So my grandfather, Martin Luther King Sr., was rescuing babies from abortion throughout his whole ministry. That's rare for a preacher. The preachers really won't deal with abortion from the pulpit. They see more people on Sunday mornings than a lot of our politicians may see all week. And they don't want the competition. And they don't want to have to deal with that. So they write these laws where they do what? They give benefits to the churches to stay out of certain areas. Don't come in the political arena, okay? And we will forgive the amount of money you have to pay in taxes. It's almost as if the government, the politicians, are paying churches to silence them. When the churches should back up on that and say, our true reward, our true payment comes from God. The most famous preacher in our family, of course, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must learn to live together as brothers, and I'll add as sisters, or perish together as fools. And I was raised not to put my confidence in politics, but in God. One of my favorite passages in the Bible talks about the people crying out for a king and a ruler. And God gave them King Saul, but he said, you're not gonna like it so much, because you've got me, and Saul is not me, but okay, I'll give you a king. And then we had King David after that, and we had many kings throughout the Bible history. So God allows politics, and you can't really put God out of anything. However, you could try to run a government without God, and you'll find out that it turns into a disaster. I really believe that some of the most powerful books in the Bible, Romans 13, for instance, says, are you afraid of the government? You should be. Obey the laws. And that's the godly God-ordained laws, not just crazy laws from people. Then you'll live well. Some of the best examples we have of Bible heroes have either been kings or governors. You know, Daniel was a politician. Queen Esther was married to a politician. And Joseph, in the time of Egypt, became one of the most powerful politicians in his culture. God's hand on Daniel, on Queen Esther, on Joseph, is evidence that God is ever present, even in the political realm. So it's very appropriate to discuss politics, but to see it through a lens with God being in charge. Jesus called out the Pharisees. He called out the Sadducees, which was the government under Caesar at that time in Israel. And when we look at how he did that, we understand that what he had to do was upset certain apple carts. He had to turn some things over in the minds of people who had gotten entrenched into a certain culture, into a certain mindset that had been placed upon them by that government of the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin Council is what they were called. What does that tell us? 
it tells us that there comes a time, especially to you pastors and preachers and you Christians out there, you need to hear me. There comes a time when you must stand up on principles. It just seems that we are walking down a road where we're allowing liberal ideology to dictate what we do, and that's taking us far, farther and farther away from God. But this whole thought of having a vaccine passport or that, you know, the mass mandates and you can't celebrate the 4th of July if you're not doing certain things or if you don't get a vaccine. You know, I look at a lot of these things and all I see is the spirit of the Antichrist. Everything is turning, not really for the good, it's turning to evil. And people love the name evil. They don't know that demons are working with them. In, in regards to religion and, and politics, the reason why people want to separate that is to, to win an argument. So to take away God from it, and so that they can have their views taken the place of what, where God had. As you see, uh, even within the Catholic Church and within like you know, Democrats, they've infiltrated the Catholic Church's once pro-life stance to get people to be on their side, even to the point of you know, Joe Biden who also claims to be a Catholic, he uses that as a push to move on. And uh, with politics, once they take that place of you know, religion, they get to twist it in their own way. Whether it's right, even though it's right in the Bible, on the stance between like, you know, marriage, uh, certain values of like, you know, celibacy. I feel they say don't talk about religion and politics is because they want to take God and the Bible out of it. And in doing so, that helps them win their worldly argument. This nation needs to know that this country was created for a moral people, a people with a moral compass. But what's gone away is that word decency. You don't, you don't hear that anymore. That, that you, it, anything goes in our nation. And so we've lost our moral compass. But this nation will not work for anyone else. As you see, it beginning to decay and, and, and become dilapidated because the moral structure of our nation is decaying and becoming dilapidated. And so go the people of that nation. You and your f***ing privilege! They won't shoot you! They won't kill you! We don't want you here! We don't want you here! The more we honor God, I'll just say his name, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the more we bring him back into this country, the more blessed we'll become and our eyes will be open because the Bible said, "Bless is the nation who God is the Lord and the people who he has chosen for his own inheritance. The Democrat party, they're removing him, you know, they removed him out of the schools, you know, and uh, they're doing everything against the Bible. So they are, they are against God, absolutely. I believe that what we see in the Democrat Party, those who are progressive and liberal all the way, uh, 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 Marxist, co uh, communist, is that they hate God. They hate God, they hate America, and they hate Americans. And what they want is to have power and control, and it's demonic. And that's why we have to be able to be restored through the faith. And that's where we are right now. We're in a place where we must fight for our faith and we can't let down. And when we get away from God, the Bible said, uh, of course, uh, the nation that forget God, that nation shall be turned over to, to hell, you know? So we don't need to be forgetting God. We need to be honoring God and lifting God up, especially right now, especially right now, because of everything that's going on, all the division. It's only a unity in Jesus Christ. God is love. And he, he loves us, he'll forgive us when you, you, when you give your life to him, when you repent. But he's also a just God where he, you know, um, the Bible said that the wages of sin is death. You know, um, you don't want to pay. You know, if you don't give your life to, over to God, you have to pay for them sins yourself. And that, that's, that's in hell, you know. We could go back to in Genesis when God destroyed a whole city behind the behavior that's been promoted of the LGBTQ when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. We're reminded throughout all the scriptures not to follow what they did. And it's, it seems to me as if America is following the same path as Sodom and Gomorrah. And it takes those who, you know, who know God to remind those who don't know God to turn back to God.
And this is where uh, the, the rubber meets the road. When they sit in the congregation, what religion has turned into and what, what our Christianity in America has turned into is a feel-good session without the truth of, and the principles of scripture being applied to the wound that is sitting there in that congregation. They're wounded. And they don't need to, be, they don't need to necessarily uh, be told that everything's okay, because everything's not okay. We're killing our children. This is what most pastors are afraid of, though. They're afraid of what happened to him. What happened to him? Well, it, it got him crucified. I believe that you totally misunderstand the mission of Christ. Without the crucifixion, pastor, there is no resurrection. There is no salvation. There is no hope for man or mankind. This is part of sharing the suffering and the ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through that, you can provide a resurrection. Uh, so recently I had a, I spoke at the Department of Education uh, hearing about critical race theory and uh, the gov Governor Ron DeSantis uh, shared it and it went viral. CRT and its outworking today is a teaching that there is a hierarchy in society where white, male, heterosexual, able-bodied able people are deemed the oppressor and anyone else outside of that uh, status is oppressed. That is a very simplistic way of looking at critical race theory, but that is ultimately the outworking of what this theory gives you when you when you start to apply these theories in real life ways. My son, when he graduated in 2012, he was a valedictorian of his high school in Virginia Beach. Number one student, he was the number one student in the entire Virginia Beach area, GPA average, right? Now, fast forward to today, they don't even have valedictorian anymore. What they have is just a base system. And, I, and I'm speaking to a person today that you can't even find out what your child's GPA is because they no longer rank students. White kids coming up believing that they're inherently racist. Black kids coming up believing that they're too stupid to compete with white kids. That's discrimination. What do I say to my mixed race 16 year old who's the most beautiful boy that you can even see? He's half black and half white. What am I gonna do? Which part is he gonna hate? Um, I've been getting so much evil hate uh, from so many people, mo uh, many of them black people, um, unfortunately, saying that I don't want um, critical race theory is just, you know, America's bad history being taught. That is not what critical race theory is. I want, for the record, <laughs> for the 50th million time, I want all American history taught. Good, bad, ugly. I want more of the successful stories. Black Americans, our contributions to this amazing country told, we have to have all of American history taught. That is not what critical race theory is. Critical race theory is a means by which we're trying to institute cultural Marxism. Like I said, it's not about socioeconomic division, it's about racial division, which will tear this country apart, which also goes back to why the left wants to do it, because they believe that's how they achieve political advantage and political gain, dominion, power, and control. It is not good for our children. We do not need teachers teaching our children that if you're a little white child, uh, you're responsible for the history of <laughs> a whole country, and you're an oppressor, and we don't need them teaching uh, all, everyone else that you are in a permanent state of oppression. What type of hope are we giving our children if we tell them that they are permanently oppressed or they are permanently an oppressor? That is a mindset that will create an out, a worldview that they will walk in. And I don't think that we are ready to see a society of these people, these little people that have grown up and are thinking that they are permanently oppressed or permanently an oppressor.
But when you have the head of the teachers union, Randy Weingarten, stand up and say that the teachers unions are going to fight parents so that they can teach them critical race theory, well, it's game on. Stop indoctrinating our children. Stop teaching our children to hate the police. It's basically white shaming. Are you aware of any time in American history when an attorney general has directed the FBI to begin to intervene in school board meetings? Please get back to just teaching our children math, science, factual history. Because now there's an organization that says that you don't own your children. You can't decide what your child is going to learn. We will. So this is a fight. If you are trained a generation of racists, those very kids gonna grow up and hate the white kids. And not only that, some of them will start killing them or doing whatever, so it's gonna cause a race riot and a race war. And that is what the Democrat Party wants, so they can bring something in uh, that's gonna clamp down on every single person. So we do not need to feed into critical race theory. It has no place in our schools, not even a place in our home, but is that what you wanna do in your home? Do it, you're free to do that in your home. But we don't need that in our institution at all. The United States uh, military is putting that into, into the military now while other countries are looking at us laughing and they can easily defeat us while we concentrating on the color of a skin. The left is infiltrating our military. And you have senior military officers like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, talking about white rage. I want to understand white rage, and I'm white. And talking about how we need to have critical race theory and this Ibrahim Kendi, he's giving him a seat at the table. How can we have a cohesive fighting force? This ain't about being woke. When you take that oath, you take that oath to the rule of law, the thing that binds us together as an American people, as a constitutional republic. It's not about black, white, Hispanic, Asian, or anything else. It's about this country. And when we are allowing our senior leaders to accept an ideology, obviously because they want to continue to be in a position of leadership, and they forget the oath that they took to a constitution, I am very concerned about the direction of the senior uh, military leadership that we have because first and foremost they should have turned to someone and said you're not going to teach any of this ideological garbage in the United States military. That's what men and women do when they remember the oath that they took. I've read Mao Zedong. I've read, I've read Karl Marx. Not to Karl Marx, cultural Marxism, not to progressive socialist leftism and liberalism, and certainly not to something that would undermine the cohesion the greatest fighting force that the world has ever known. During the days of Babel, when they were building a tower, God divided the people according to culture and language, not skin color. Nobody's skin looks totally black without the blues and the magentas in that skin. Nobody looks like a white piece of paper. So we are all colored people. So there is a critical race. It's the human race. People have voted Democrat, especially in the African-American community for years. I guess you can trace that back to Martin Luther King, you know, John F. Kennedy, uh, siding with him, uh, letting him out of jail, uh, showing sympathy in that, in that regards. And so from that point on, you know, it's, Democrats have been seen as champions of the African-American community. But what we've seen is that their policies actually are harmful to the African-American community. I come from Detroit, Michigan originally. We had the first black mayor, which was Coleman Young, and he was a Democrat. So I'm able to see what the long-term effects are. And when we had Coleman Young, not only did they control the city, they controlled the city, they controlled the police, and they also controlled the drug business. And these are facts, sir. I know what I'm talking about. I mean, yes, I was very involved with the um, Democratic Party. I would go to their meetings, you know, where I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this is 21, 2021, and we're holding this meeting. Damn, did we just have this meeting in 2018, in 2017, in 2000, in 1985, and nothing has been done yet. And we're still holding the same meetings, still trying to complete the same projects. It's crazy because we are, we sitting there, you know, they are. Oliver, can you come to the meeting? We want you to come to the meeting. I'll go to the meeting. Y'all talk about the same shit y'all was talking about in 2021. 20 damn 20. And ain't a damn thing been done yet. So what the hell y'all want me to come and listen to the same shit over and over again? You know? Are those people that you are voting for every single year, are they racist? They're the ones that's keeping you on a Democrat plantation. And to me, that's racist. 
When I was a kid, we used to stand in line for government cheese and other handouts. I remember us being in the blistering sun in the summertime, waiting to eat, waiting for something to fill our swollen bellies. Not like in Africa, but American poverty. I remember thinking that all of us that were there, everyone in my community looked like me. We were all black Americans. As I grew up, I realized we had something else in common. We all lived in Democrat-run cities. When we look at all the crime and violence across the country, we look at what's going on in these inner cities, they're being run by progressive mayors, right? In Baltimore City, we have a progressive state's attorney who is soft on crime and criminals are running the streets. And I think that's first and foremost because I think everybody wants a safe neighborhood, right? When you no longer have your safety, uh, you don't have a lot. One of the main ways that liberals harm our nation is not being honest about what they really are about. So they claim that they are for minorities, they claim that they are for helping you know, black people in particular. However, the policies that they push today are still pervasively harming the black community and minority communities, for instance, abortion, uh, anti-biblical marriage ethics. It is very harmful to young people growing up and they're, they're believing that the, this party is for them when they are pushing things that are against their self-interest, self against their best interest. And so I think that is a special kind of evil. This no, quote unquote notion that somehow we need to get in and take the, uh, the racism out of America, uh, then we need to remove the Democrats. The uh, Democrats and the liberals together, what they, they are doing came together on one accord and they are pushing their twisted agenda off on the black community, therefore destroying the black community and destroying our nation. They think that the black community is very easy to be manipulated and so they go through the black community thinking that, well, we won't get any pushback no matter what we do because we coming through the black community to get this uh, enacted. For example, the uh, fraud in the uh, election on past November the 3rd, if you notice, if you look in the cities mostly ran by black, this is where all the fraud was. Fulton County is where most of the fraud happened and Fulton County is ran by mostly black people. But the white liberal is behind the scene. They have the blacks out front and using them. So that is what is destroying America. They using uh, slavery, which happened hundreds of years ago to make us think that we are oppressed when we're really not oppressed. And we are, uh, most of our community is falling for it. You see the lack of educational freedom. You know, is, there is no reason why the Democrats, you would think if they're for black people, they would support school choice. But school choice is not something they want to have because if you're not affording people in the black community, in our inner cities, a good quality education, then you're not enabling them to be a part of the equality of opportunity that this great country has. The main way that liberals and Democrats are harming our country is through our children, through the sexualization of children, teaching our kids very inappropriate things in schools, promoting sex changes in children before they're even reaching puberty. That not only hurts us currently, but it hurts the future. Jim Crow is a creature of the Democratic Party. Um, uh, the Ku Klux Klan is a creature of the Democratic Party. Uh, when you look at the, the, the court decisions, three-fifths of citizens, these were democratic policies. Uh, separate but equal, democratic policies. And so you talk about George Floyd and having the foot on the neck, but the Democratic Party has had their foot on the neck of black people for over 200 years. The damage that is being done by them is to distort the success that America has been in the eyes and mind of its youth is distorting the story of a nation that has come out of uh, its past, which did have its troubles, to a place that has become the greatest success story on the face of the planet and the greatest story ever told in human history as far as a nation is concerned. They're poisoning the minds of our young people. And when you poison the mind of young people, then you begin to take away all of the achievements that the trials and troubles that our ancestors trudged through 
to get us to this place. It's time for us to walk away from the lies, from the controlling spirit, and from every uh, method and everything that they have formed against us. We have two parties, if not just for one reason at all, for once in your life, say, I'm going to vote Republican or some other party just to see what it better our lives because the last six or seven years voting Democrats we've been guaranteeing our votes for them and we still struggling we still complain about every single thing it is you know it's all about the waking up process of course it's a painful one you know sometimes you lose family members you know I've seen on social media some people are not speaking to their family because you know the, um, the family is democratic and that particular individual decides to become a conservative. But, you know, it's all about waking up. Back in the day, the Republican Party was the party of the black people. You know, that's, we all had conservative views. The Republican Party was reconstructed by Frederick Douglass, one of the most prominent black men that paid for his own freedom in this country. And everybody has to realize that. You know, if you know the history, you know the strength of the black American. Many years ago, the 30, 30, nearly 35 years ago now, I was president of the NAACP in Garland, Texas. And of course, uh, at the time that I left the NAACP, I was a Democrat. But I left the Democrat Party, being a Democrat at the time myself, because I received a directive from then director of the national organization, Dr. Benjamin Hooks, God rest his soul. And the directive uh, asked me to go and speak at a pro-choice rally. Now, this to me could not happen because of my core values. I was the minister of evangelism at the church I was serving at that time. And so I sent back, we didn't have the cell phones and all that type thing, but I, I mimeographed back uh, to him. Uh, these words, uh, sir, with due respect, I cannot participate in a pro-choice rally. Once that particular light came on, it then caused me to question, how is it possible that I continue to vote then for the party that pushes this type of idea. Well, if we're talking about Joe Biden, see, that's, again, going back to the history. You're talking about a man that's been in politics since 1960. I was born in 63. Most of us know that he's probably one of the biggest racists around. Listen to the things that come out of his mouth. Listen to the words that he say. You know, when, he's, when uh, he say, oh, if you don't vote for me, then, you know, you're not black enough. They're gonna put you all back in chains. You know, how you gonna tell me as a black person, how as an independent thinker, as a black woman, how are you gonna tell me who I should vote for? How are you gonna tell me how I should think? And then you're gonna go so far as to insinuate that we are not even capable of being business owners because we don't have a ID because we don't have a lawyer, because he, we don't have an accountant. Young black entrepreneurs are just as capable of succeeding given the chance as white entrepreneurs are. But they don't have lawyers, they don't have, they, they, they don't have accountants. As a business owner, I've been in business over 30 years. As a business owner, of course I have a lawyer, of course I have an accountant, but you know, you can find those people in the phone books every day you know you can find them on the internet any day of the week so how are you going to say that we don't have access to them so that just shows right there it shows your mentality it shows what you think about people and it's very demeaning it's very demeaning for you to talk about black people that way. It's very demeaning for you to say those words out of your mouth. And it's very judgmental. So to me, that speaks volumes about what you really feel about black people and what you really feel about black America. All the blacks that I know drive, if they don't, they, uh, you know, take, you know, 
uh, public commute, but that's because that's their choice. So if they're able to go get their driver license and take a driver's test, which every state requires. Why can they not be uh, capable enough to get a voter ID? I don't know a black person that doesn't have an ID. You know, I think that's so insane. I think it's insulting. I think it's actually racist in itself to say that black people can't obtain an ID. They don't want responsibility because they know what? They, they, they've been taken and uh, and basically just going out there lying in the system, messing with the system, messing with the uh, voter integrity. And the Democrats are afraid of the term accountability because it means that they can't sneak and lie. And the question should not be what the Democrats are doing to us. The question should be, why are they pushing such a hard agenda? And I'm gonna give you the answer. Because they know if they mentally control black America, they are in control of the voting systems, they are in control of the people's minds. Because something people do know about us, we ain't going nowhere, because we didn't come from Africa. Our ancestors were right here in the country we built. Now, and what does that mean? Everybody know we'll burn down before we leave, and this is a fact. But by making this a civil rights issue, they know that black people are going to fight that battle for them. But the real target is that they want to make it easier for illegal immigrants to vote. <laughs> um, but again, if you push a racist narrative behind it, black people will be your warriors. They'll be your fighters on the front line and they'll be the ones pushing it for you while you pull the string. So in many ways, I think the Democrats are like they're like that person who seeks division, who thrives on chaos. And I think they're doing that to all of America right now. So we have to be the change that we want to see. And I think the only way it's going to change is if people in their community step up and say, I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm officially announcing my 2022 candidacy for the United States House of Representatives of the Second District of Virginia. We've got to get our country back. Yeah. The absence of action really is the causation of problems. For example, uh, I turn the water on in my tub and it, it's plugged up and it rises and rises. And someone looks at it and says, oh gosh, I didn't do anything with that. I mean, I didn't start that. I didn't start the problem. And they walk away. The water rises and rises, gets all over the floor. It finally gets in their bedroom, right? And they say, well, um, I, I, I didn't do anything. You know, I, it's not my fault. Well, it is your fault because you could have turned the water off. And I believe God puts us all through tests. I believe that, and I think he's testing this country as well. What side are you standing on? Who are you standing with? Are you with me or are you not with me? So the Christians have to stand up because it's not just about us. It's about them standing up, standing up for God and speaking for God as well. I'm a believer. As long as we stand up and fight, somebody fought for me, and we have to fight for these generations to come. If we want to know why the black community is not coming to the Republican Party, it's because we have not went to the black community. Unity does not look like all one party. It looks like multiple people coming together because they're tired of the divide that started. That's where I'm trying to get uh, our county, our community, our neighbors, our neighborhoods, our country to. You remember the days of when uh, the Macy's stores, your Sears stores used to have the mannequin in the window? And the mannequin was always dressed in something that would entice you to go into the window and look for that thing, or they have several mannequins. Well, in the Republican window, okay, there's only the one mannequin, and that mannequin is white. When we know for sure that there are black Republicans in the store, but you'll never know that by looking at the mannequin. It's extremely important to have Republicans, regardless of their race, run for office so we can change the mannequin in the front of the window. So we will attract more people coming into our store. I, I think on the Democratic side, they do this very, very well. They put black mannequins in the window. They put Asian Hispanic mannequins in the window to attract uh, gay mannequins in, in, in the window to, to attract those types of people in because they're looking for votes. Right now, they're putting illegals in the window to attract those people to come in that party, right? Yes, we need to have people who happen to be black, happen to be white, happen to be Hispanic, Asian, run for office. That's critically important. The fact that they happen to be black or happen to be Hispanic ought to be a plus. But the notion is that we need to be a party that believes that race and the color of skin don't define, don't define who gets into the office or who gets nominated.
I've, I've seen it. I get it. I don't care whether I'm elected or not. I don't care uh, whether or not you're not going to vote for me next time, but I'm not going to sit here and cower down to the left's agenda. I'm not going to cower down to these rhinos and people who are really not concerned about the GOP uh, principles that have been in place for decades. And so we need those type of Republicans, those Republicans that saying, you know what, my name is on the ballot, but when I say what I'm getting ready to say, you can either vote for me or not, but I'm going to fight because I'm fighting for all people. And at the end of the day, I can go to bed because my conscience is clear because I stood with on what is right. The worst thing we can have is have Republicans in name only on our front lines or in our ranks. How can you build a ship and you have the people who are going to destroy the ship on the same committee of the committee who are building the ship? How can you fight a war against the enemy and you have the people who are helping the enemy on the same side of the people who are fighting the enemy? They believe in the destruction. And, and why do they believe in destruction? Because remember, the Republicans in name only are in many cases the ones in power, in the seats. How, do, how does a Republican in name only stay in power? By keeping out other Republicans. Therein builds your club. I used to get the news filtered by my parents. Both my parents were Democrats. I thought President Obama, by all appearances, is a great husband, a great father, and that's family structure that the black community needs to see. Too many fathers are also missing. Too many fathers are MIA. Wow, family structure, the importance of education. Look at this, this is amazing. The first black family, it was like the Huxtables, right? From the Cosby show. I was like, this is awesome. Uh, but he gets in office and then all of a sudden he completely changes his tune. Right. He starts going out and, and talking about, remember, the whole the death of Trayvon Martin, uh, that whole case. Uh, Trayvon Martin could have been me uh, 35 years ago. And he talked about racism all the time, talked about being oppressed, talked about how America is so bad for the black man or for black families. And I'm thinking, here's a guy that was just elected as the first black president in this country. So I switched over to the Republican Party, I ended up joining the Baltimore County Republican Central Committee, uh, and I've been a Republican ever since. I left the Democratic Party in 2018 when I ran for Congress uh, for District 27. I changed to the Republican Party in 2018. I remain, I remain a non-party affiliate after I changed from Democrat before I went to Republican because I need to be in purgatory for a while after I've been a sinner for so many years in the Democratic Party. I have to clean up my palate and clean up my spirit and then go back. Yes, I was uh, once a Democrat. Um, I always say, typically, if you're black and conservative, there's a story behind it because most black folks are raised as a Democrat. The real monumental uh, change that happened for me was I felt God speaking to my heart saying that your skin color had become an idol in your life. That revelation for me was um, life transforming. It changed my life. I literally felt the shackles of limitations, the shackles of a broken mindset fall away. Once I saw my true identity in Christ, and not through my skin color. It was, um, it was transforming. If you don't believe and think as the left wants you to, that's part of that cultural Marxism, that's part of that racial divisiveness, then they're gonna brand you a white supremacist. It's like living in a neighborhood when everybody all the neighbors tell you, don't talk to the girl that just moved in. She's bad, she will take your husband away. But you have never talked to that girl, but you go by whatever everybody said until one day you walk in the dark and you find out she's nice. But the others are gonna be against you because you're talking to that person when we told you she was bad. Why stay loyal to something or someone that's not loyal to you? It was really heartbreaking. My mom is a, a Democrat, and it breaks my heart to see my own family. They've walked away from me. It was still hard for me as a former Democrat to put that R in front of my name. It was just so difficult. And I, I've noticed that to be the case for so many black people. They just, they, 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 they just can't bring themselves to saying Republican. I'm a Republican. The notion that we have to treat white people as if they're somehow the bad people and they're keeping blacks from progressing is defeated when you look at many black people who have made it. We have to put off the stereotypes, put aside the anger and the hurt, 
We've got to reach for that American dream because our Constitution says we can have it, and by God, we can. Through technology, through change laws, through activism, through information and truth, Black America has every opportunity if they just set their mind to it. There's nothing in this country at this point in time that the color of my skin will stop me from doing. I want to specifically say to my African-American family, we matter, we count, we are part of God's entire creation. I do believe that the people of color are a persevering, relentless culture. We have to have enough, enough courage to get out there and say, it doesn't matter whether your hair is gray and you're white and you want to go out there and say, I don't think I can do it. We can do it. We can get together. Look at Martin Luther King who marched down the streets holding hand in hand with all kinds of races, denominations and creeds. And he was able to do what? Create unity. And, and you know, in my own case, how is it you can have a uh, lawyer who has practiced law 42 years, longer than anyone who's ever run the Republican Party, as Attorney General in 400 years. We've come from not being officers in the military to having officers in the military. We've come from not having elected officials to having people like Senator Tim Scott. We've come a long way. We always survived. We were always a close-knit family. And there is so much hope in loving and being involved and being included with dignity, kindness, and civility. We're Americans. God is doing an amazing thing with this nation, and there are more people like me that are starting to open their eyes and wake up. And by the grace of God, I'm 26 and still have good knees. There's a lot of work to be done. The laborers are few and the harvest is plenty. So I would encourage those who are out there, don't be afraid. God gives you a spirit of courage and boldness. We are some of the best and brightest among our nation and our communities. So we come together as brothers and sisters not divided by skin color, embracing each other and everyone with love. Historically, the black community has always been a strong group. We survived slavery, we survived Jim Crow. We actually survived the depression better than white people did. So we always survived. We were always a close-knit family. We'll survive and we, we understand how to survive and, and we'll make our own way. I think black people are some of the most powerful people in this country. Blacks measure up to whites in, in, in economics, they measure up to whites in the political arena, they measure up to whites in the military. I don't see this time as a time of despair, uh, depression, dejection. I don't see what is happening right now as an obstacle. I see opportunities. I see opportunities for us to once again understand who we are as America, the longest running constitutional republic that the world has ever known, and get back to those first principles the things that make us the greatest nation that the world is in. In this country, there's equal opportunity. You can work hard, you can become educated, you can get out of the situations that you're in. America is a beautiful country. You know, it was founded upon the right ideas and principles. It's not a racist country. Believe in yourself. Believe in the country that you live in. Stand up for it. There's nothing wrong with being patriotic. It's a beautiful thing. I am an American. I will salute my country's flag, honor the men and women who protect it and pledge allegiance for which it stands. I will not apologize for doing what's right. Be put aside without a fight. Be sat down, be tossed around, or be shut down. I only need to search my heart, praise the Lord, and preach his word because I am an American. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so nothing like freedom? We held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. Or the ramparts we watched were so gallant.
gently streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night That our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free? I said the land of the free and the home of the brave The home of the free